I'm Rebecca Hardy and welcome to our BAFTA Cymru Film Career Session, part of the Guru Live Online Spring 2021 programme. This year, BAFTA Cymru are running a joint initiative with BAFTA Scotland, where we'll be celebrating and inspiring the next generation of Scottish and Welsh talent with a week of special panels and masterclasses. This session today is sponsored by Screen Alliance Wales, Offer Grid and Pontio. Um, as we've become accustomed to with these types of Zoom events, there's a little bit of housekeeping beforehand. Uh, these virtual events are part of BAFTA's learning work to share expertise from film, games and television with audiences far and wide. Check out BAFTA.org and BAFTA's social channels for more activity and news. You can join the conversation on social using the hashtag Guru Live, and you can ask your questions anytime during the session. Please send them in via the Zoom Q&A function and we'll pick those up towards the end of the session. Closed captioning is available now, which you can turn on on the bottom of your screen. So I think that's the end of the housekeeping. And without further ado, please welcome our speakers. Gwenvere Hawkins, the Development Executive from Film Cymru Wales writer Claire Pete and writer-director Karis Lewis. Hello. Hello everyone. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Lovely to have you here uh, today. I'm very much inspired by all of your work in the film industry so it's going to be wonderful to hear from all three of you across this hour's session. Um, I thought we'd just start with a bit of a chat about what's happening in Wales film-wise, so we can kind of get a sense of what's happening out there at the moment, films that we might be aware of being made or shot, and particularly during this slightly challenging time, but really what's to sort of hopefully come as well. Um, Gwenver, uh, as a development executive of Film Cymru Wales, very warm welcome to you. Um, I thought we'd start with you just to get a bit of a, a set, uh, you know, a feel from you about what's sort of happening film-wise across Wales at the moment. Sure. So, um, hi, I'm Gwen Vyde. I'm the development exec at Film Cymru, one of. Um, so primarily development, because that's what a lot of the film industry has been able to do while filming is still sort of uh, tricky, to say the least, around COVID. But we have started to shoot some shorts. So on the network side, we've shot... Um, a short written and directed by Mac Nixon in South Wales. And then we've got uh, the filmmaker Tom Chetwood Barton filming in Northwest Wales, um, this kind of queer coming of age story where figures from the Mabinogion turn up as drag queens type of thing. It's, it's excellent. Um, and then I know that across our production slate, things have started to open up and maybe Claire can speak Oh, later on, so I know that everything, but it's oh, can you hear oh, me? We just lost, just lost you there for a short while. I'm not sure if that was that, that was me or you, um, but absolutely, I'm gonna unpick uh, a little bit of Claire's work very soon, actually, which Sorry. is really nice, nice of you to, to mention it. In terms of features that you've supported, um, sort of perhaps before the pandemic, I know that there's a few coming out and, and hotly anticipated. So, uh, Dream Horse, I know, is, is on its way, starring Tony Collette and Damien Lewis. Uh, which is exciting and I've, I've just as a bit of a rebel wilson fan i've been following her and her work with mad as birds films up in north wales um so seeing that they've just finished finished shooting there um are there kind of any other others that have been filmed sort of before the pandemic that we can look forward to perhaps seeing in the next kind of year or so in the cinemas or at home and that yeah, can be to so yeah so i think we've got um six minutes to midnight which came out recently um, which is a kind of World War II thriller with uh, Eddie Izzard and Dame Judi Dench. Um, and then we've also got um, Rare Beasts, which is Billy Piper's directorial debut. That's going to be available for viewing soon. And I think is a really, she's a really exciting, obviously we know her as a performer, but I think she's a really exciting kind of writing, directing voice to look out for as well. So I'd keep eyes peeled for that. Um, and then, as you said, Dream Horse, you know, as a South Wales girl, I'm so excited for that to come out, <laughs> for people to get all the warm fuzzies, that'll be really, I think we earned it, to be honest, this past year. 
That's great. There's some really, really wonderful work coming out. And I've, I've also heard that the Eternal Daughter was shot early on this year, sneakily in Wales, which is uh, starring uh, Tilda Swinton. So um, I'm kind of keeping my eye on that as well. And in terms of sort of what's happening with that project, it sounds fantastic. So there's, there's quite a lot happening in terms of short films and features coming out. Claire and Karis, is there anything across Wales that you're involved in at the moment, or not even just, just in Wales, but things that you're involved in film production wise or colleagues? Um, you know, that's sort of happening at the moment that would be great to sort of share. Uh, not in film, but in TV. Yes, I've, I'm, I've just had a, a TV series um, potentially being commissioned um, this week. So uh, just that, that's in development. So that's really good. So that, that will mark my first um, TV series um, after my It's My Shout. But um, in terms of film, no, it's 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 nothing to do with Wales. Unfortunately, it's, it started off with film company funding, which is, you know, it wouldn't have got any further if it hadn't had that. So that early development funding is everything. But after that, it's it's moved out of Wales. It has you're to be. Some, yeah. You're literally in the heart of uh, film right now, aren't you, in terms of your your first uh, feature, The Colour Room. Claire, can you just tell us a little bit about that? Actually, it'd be great to sort of hear about your, your journey into that. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I did an MA in script writing. I, I'm a novelist. And um, I thought I'd, I'd convert one of my novels into a, a film. And uh, it was harder than I thought it was. <laughs> So I did an MA, which I absolutely loved at the University of South Wales. Oh, I had such a good time. And um, I did my final project and we were going around the table saying, you know, what, what, what do you want to do for your final project? And everyone was coming up with these amazing ideas. And I had no idea what my final project was going to be. And I'd just been reading about Clarice Cliff and my mum's got a piece. And I was like, well, she's quite, quite interesting. So, I'll, you know, I'll do a film biopic on Clarice Cliff for my final project. And um my lecturers were like, oh no, don't, don't do that. No, don't do biopics, don't do a period piece, you know, do, do something contemporary. And, uh, but I did, <laughs> and it went really well. And so, you know, that's that's what's in film now. So that's up in Stoke-on-Trent. So we're in the six weeks filming, and we're in the fifth, uh, we're in the sixth week. So we've got three days left um, up in Birmingham, Stoke and Leek. Fantastic. And congratulations on the project. And it sort of does make sense, really, that you're filming up in Stoke on Trent with the Potteries and Clarice Cliff. So absolutely, you know, those natural links there. And yeah, very much looking forward to seeing it, Claire. And congratulations on sort of getting that off the ground and, and for shooting right now up in the middle. Uh, Karis, in terms of your work, I know that you've done lots of short films, um, BAFTA come re-nominated, Beacon supported. Just tell us a little bit about sort of where you are and, and your film work at the moment. Yeah, so um, I think you know, again, because of COVID, um, I've been mostly developing stuff this year. So um, I'm working, uh, currently writing uh, my first feature, which is um, funded by uh, Film Wheels. And then um, a lot of my other work this year has mostly been in TV. So I'm working on two, a one hour drama um, that's supported by CBC in Canada, and then a half hour dramedy, um, again, that's uh, funded by CBC. So it's been like, I've been finding personally, it's been a year of like a lot of writing. People are wanting to take meetings um, and that kind of, that boost into the development is, has been like really good. And people are like reading scripts um, and looking for new content. On like the filming side, um, BBC and Film Wheels, I mean, Gwen Barr could, could tell you more than I could, but they're, they're, they've been really active in supporting new voices. So I've been mentoring a few filmmakers through their folio scheme. Um, so that's been fun and we've shot a few things and I'm mentoring another uh, emerging director and he's shooting his first film um, towards the end of the month, so. That's fantastic. It's great to know that some people are very much involved still in film and, and that migration between film and television is often mm -hmm. often happens a lot doesn't it in terms of kind of people's work and context but it's great to know that things are in development and people are you know sort of still very much involved and Karis lovely to know about your mentoring as well so you might unpick that a little bit more as, as we yeah. go along and um, just notice a couple of questions already flying in please do pop them into the Q&A box and we will pick those up just towards the end of the session so please do get involved and share your questions with us and um, so you've both kind of mentioned you've all mentioned slightly different journeys you know, what, what do you think are the general or the sort of starting points for anybody to get into the film industry? I would imagine we've all got different different routes, but it'd be great to sort of hear from your point of view, sort of a route that you've taken or routes that you're very familiar with. So if someone's starting to think about, you know, getting into film, 
what might be a typical route that they might end up going down? Anybody can yeah. jump on that question. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. I feel like me and Karis is quite similar, to be honest. So, yeah, did you start off in theatre as well? Right? Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, um, in, in Canada at least, there isn't like so much of a connection between the film and TV and theatre communities. Like here, it seems like that transition and that. Um, that kind of mutual respect is there. Whereas in Canada, I went to like a very sort of British conservatory classical theater training program um, and started working in theater. And then I slowly transitioned um, to film and TV first as a screenwriter and then a director. Um, so I think, but I, I think that's maybe less, you know, um, less common maybe in, in Canada and America than it is in the UK. I don't know. What do you think, Gwenvar? Yeah, I think it's I think it's super common over here. Um, mm. And I think it's, I don't quite know why, but I think it's important because I think especially starting out a career in somewhere like Wales, to be realistic, I think keeping as many kind of things going across different media Mm -hmm. as possible is is going to be really important both for both for your financial well-being and also I think for your kind of sense of self-worth as an artist because if you're relying solely on just being able to make films you're going to go swathes of time without getting any work and that can mm -hmm. really have a detrimental effect on how you view yourself as a person as an artist in the world so I think yeah. I really really encourage um the, the filmmakers that I work with, particularly the emerging ones, to be actively seeking out other kind of creative avenues so that they can kind of keep that mm. cognitive process ticking on and, you know, pay the bills. And I, yeah, and I think in a weird way, like my theatre training was actually better for me as a writer than going to film and TV school because I spent three years analysing text and you know, analyzing characters and breaking down beats and intention and objection. And, you know, like, so I think it kind of depends what you want to do. I think if you want to be, you know, um, in lighting or like behind the camera, then I think film school is a really smart idea because you're meeting so many different people and, you know, that's the way that you build your community. Um, yeah. I think, I think that's a use... super important point, right? It's mm -hmm. it's figuring out who, what kind of filmmaker you want to be and mm -hmm. then figuring out a path to get there. So I didn't go to film or theatre school. I just did an English degree. But now that I work in development, that kind of analysis of text and of structure and of story and of character is <laughs> like, finally, I can tell those people who said an English degree <laughs> would be useless. It's really useful for me. Um, but yeah, so that's facilitated me to get to where I am today but that's as Kara said if you want to be a, a lighting designer perhaps an English degree isn't the one um it's very yeah. it's very it's really interesting those crossover skills and I think we're sort of uh, looking at those more more so at the moment really with the pandemic and things happening we've sort of started to realize mm -hmm. that actually a lot of people in events have got a huge amount of skills that can come into the film industry and interestingly I start I studied in theatre as well so there's three of us in this space now that have also started theatre to migrate into film and um, would you kind of say that sort of starting the short film is quite a traditional way that people would then get into kind of features so to start to build up your kind of you know your work and your style and, and your and kind of who you're about your vision because Claire yeah. you, you started didn't you in shorts yeah I know I do I really really enjoy the theatre I love the theatre but I have absolutely no interest in writing for it so I'm your I'm your other one <laughs> <laughs> but I'm I'm I started out doing it's my shout so I, I was lucky enough to win it's my shout a couple of years ago and that was amazing so that's that's partnered with Bridgend Youth Theatre um, and they put on they pay for everything and sort out your short film and they help you develop it um, you can have like, I think it's up to 10 applications a year. Um, so if you've got lots of ideas, you don't have to pick the best one. You can you can send loads in. I think I sent three in and one of those was picked. And it was amazing. There was there were 40 crew up a Welsh mountain in a heat wave, uh, lugging very heavy equipment <laughs> um, and making my film. And I learned so much. I learned so much about what goes on behind the scenes, you know, and how my script is interpreted and and just what roles everyone does. And it definitely made me a better writer. And 
it gave me confidence as well. It, it really did um, in, in how simple it is, really, when you boil it down. There's no magic. There's, you know, it's just it's, it's business. It's a job. And, and you are there as part of a cog in a wheel. You know, and um, it really helped. And I, I also I worked at the BBC in a job not connected with the film industry or TV industry, just a supporting function. But that helped normalise the industry as well. So it wasn't this untouchable thing that was just out there. It was just people doing jobs. And, and, and it, it just, again, it gave me confidence that I could have a role in this industry. Because when you're outside looking in, it just seems so scary. And it just seems like it's, it can't possibly for me as well, because people in front of the camera are so, are so glamorous and so self-possessed and you're confident. And, you know, you just wonder like, how, how does one get into that? But it's actually, when you do small steps, it's really easy. So yeah, I, I, I wouldn't, it's my shout. And then from then on, I had an agent and, and um, I entered BAFTA Rockcliffe actually. BAFTA Rockcliffe is another really, really good way in um, because a lot of writers, I think they'll know things like BBC Writers Room and so on, but there's like six, six and a half thousand people enter that every year. And they're looking for very particular things to, to very particular skill sets to work on BBC dramas, which isn't for everyone. But BAFTA Rockcliffe, um, there's not six and a half thousand people entering that. It's, so it, it's easier to win, in effect. Um, you have three winners a year uh, in lots of different genres. So you have film, but there's also comedy, there's children's and young adults, there's, there's all sorts. So, um, you know, you, you can go with what you're particularly interested in. And for me, that was amazing. So I, I won Rockcliffe, went down to Piccadilly, BAFTA headquarters. They put on 10 minutes of my film, which was The Colliery, which is the one that's in production now. And after that, um, they pick it apart on stage, which is horrible. <laughs> it's just mortifying. Um, but there's lots of producers, directors and so on in the audience. The audience was packed and they pick up new talent from there. So I got picked up straight away. The day after I had like six producers meeting it back to back um, and I, the colouring got optioned straight away and now we're in development. So, so BAFTA Rockcliffe is a really, really good way to get in into the industry. There's, there's lots of support um, online and also Farah who runs BAFTA Rockcliffe, she's, she's written a book about um, about writing, which is, is really useful to, to write as well to get in. Great. And it's it, what's what's great to hear as well, Claire, is that, you know, you're entering these things and people are looking at your work and picking them up. And, you know, there are different uh, opportunities out there at the moment, which we perhaps if we just touch upon that very, very lightly, just for a moment, actually, because I know it's my shout at the moment. It's worth having a look at. I think they might be uh, here in Wales, um, you know, taking on different scripts at the moment. Um, obviously, BAFTA Rock Life and there's the uh, Shore scripts as well. I think they're I think their entry deadline closes very soon but they are also another mechanism to get your work seen and of course there is the beacon scheme which is open at, at the moment Gwenevere I'm just going to um, come to you just to find out a little bit about that and then I Karis I might just pick up with you after that about your experience of working on beacons if that's okay so Gwenevere if you can just tell us a little bit about beacons that'd be fantastic. Yes yeah, so basically beacons is funded by uh, BFI Network and it is our fund that we solely um, that is solely restricted to shorts and the idea is what with um, kind of touching a bit on what Claire said ultimately you know the film industry is an industry is people doing jobs and to get your film financed um, quite often production companies or financiers will want to see an example of your work like a, a calling card so to speak and so Beacons is how we can help filmmakers create that calling card a short of about 10 to 50 minutes length that they can then send out and you know everyone's properly paid it's a healthy budget um, and so you've got the kind of resources at your hands to make something that looks really professional um, and there's a development period that we will work with you along the way in terms of refining the script. If you're working with producers who perhaps have only done a couple of shorts before and micro budgets, you know, we'll help you interrogate that budget and think about, um, yeah, just think about the project both creatively and strategically. And then once it's made, um, we'll, we can help you with a film festival strategy and it will eventually get broadcasted by BBC Wales and live on the iPlayer, the iPlayer, I sound like my mother, <laughs> on iPlayer for a few months. Um, that again, you can kind of use as, um, as a plus for potential producers you want to work with, because, you know, having something supported by the BBC is, 
is a really good indicator of a kind of rubber, rubber stamp of approval from a broadcaster. Um, yeah, we tend to get about 100 applications a year and then we'll narrow it down to 10 for a development process. Again, talking about kind of script and, and budget and we're looking to commission about five. Um, but I really would recommend going for it because although, you know, those odds don't sound super, super good, it is, <laughs> It is a relationship building thing and it's often how we meet new filmmakers or emerging filmmakers and begin to have that dialogue so even if you're not um, selective for the development process you've, you've got a relationship that we can chat and yeah brilliant it's a great scheme and the closing date's in june isn't it so there's there's plenty of time for people to kind of piece together their work and get that submitted into June. And Karis, you were successful with your Beacons um, funding and that was with your short film Stuffed, is that, that's right, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And uh, one yeah. of my favourite comedy shorts, and I'm, I'm gonna put my hands up right now. I think it's brilliant. I think it's hilariously oh, funny and I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. And of course, BAFTA Cymru nominated as well. What was your experience like working on the Beacons scheme? Yeah, I think, I mean, Beacons is, is so, incredibly unique and you know when Gwenefire says there's a hundred applicants that's actually in the in the big scheme of things as Claire mentioned like that's really not that many applicants when you what did you say Claire like 6,000 for applications for the drama room that's like you know it, it, so so apply apply um I had already shot a couple things um one was like a super low budget documentary that was, well, zero budget really. It was just me and um, asking people to, to help me. And then um, I shot a film for Iris Prize, um, Beth and Malo's short film, Aviach. So I had some experience, um, but not like not a lot really. You know, I think I'd never gone to film school. Um, and so Beacons was an amazing way to learn and and make mistakes and figure out what what worked what didn't work um and there's not that many chances for filmmakers to get 15 grand to make their short films like it's my shout again is is amazing like like Claire said they take care of everything but I think having that support um and you know because it also has the BFI stamp, it's gonna be on iPlayer. Like it really, really, really helps you. And, and I mean, don't quote me on this, but I don't know very many people who go on to direct TV and films without shot film. Like I don't really know, you know, I feel like you have to have a shot film. So it's a really good way in. Um, and it's definitely, you know, helped me develop my feature and, and kind of move my my career on that way. That's great. Thanks, Karis. And obviously, just to mention as well, for those um, animators and animation uh, animators out there, uh, Beacons does also support animation as well. And uh, Creepy Pasta Salad, which was nominated also for BAFTA Cymru Award, was also one of the Beacons film as well. So lots of success yeah. that seems to come from the from the Beacons work, which is wonderful and a fantastic scheme for us filmmakers here in Wales. Um, before I move on to sort of thinking about feature films, just want to pick up on any sort of training. Karis, you mentioned about mentoring earlier on mm -hmm. um, and any training or uh, opportunities that, that are available here in Wales. I will just do a little shout out to one of our sponsors, Screen Alliance Wales. They're really worth having a look at. They do quite a lot of training. Do check out their websites. Mm -hmm. and please do obviously check out the other sponsors, Offer Grid and Pontio as well, which also have their own uh, own uh, opportunities and things available for filmmakers. But just from your experience, you in terms of training and sort of development, what, what's out there in Wales for people to sort of uh, take up or to, to consider taking up? Yeah, there's so movie oh. nights. At, sorry, there's movie nights at Chapter. Um, so they have like a makers' night every month uh, where they screen films that people have shot, written, done all themselves, and there's a Q and A afterwards. And it's really good to see what other people are doing, you know, and also hook up with directors, writers, producers, you know, and 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 start the ball rolling on that. So for for upcoming filmmakers, chapter movie nights is definitely one to Google and go along to. And you can just sit there and listen. You don't have to take part, you know, and, and, and um, or, or you can go there meet people and go for a drink, you know, one day when we can see people again, <laughs> um, go for a drink there. But, you know, that's fantastic. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Claire. Uh, uh, Gwenvo, is there some, in terms of, sort of training and support that perhaps Film Cymru in Wales might offer? Yes, I think definitely sign up to our mailing list because we do quite a few um, training and support events throughout the year. Um, we also have a strand of funding called Horizons that you can apply for um, CPD costs, so continued professional development costs. <laughs> so we've got a few people on the slate who um, come in for some money so they can have sessions with mentors, be they producers or directors or writers. I also think it's really important as well to stress that um, that kind of truism, it's not about what you know, it's what about who you know. And I think that is actually a really positive thing because then that means that you don't need a degree necessarily. You just need to get in the room and meet the right people. So look at the films that the BFI has sponsored, short films, features, look at the films that we've sponsored reach out to someone on Twitter or over email and ask if you can have a cup of tea, albeit virtually, and pick their brains. I think kind of being a bit gorilla about it and mm -hmm. ma making your own networks is really important. And, you know, it's free. <laughs> it's free and you can do that and you can be in kind of in charge of that. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, Karis, were you going to pick up on something there? Were you mentoring or your experience through that as well? Yeah, so there's... Um... Film Wales and BBC are doing, well, they have done a scheme called Folio for, you know, new filmmakers that I think they're going to bring back in some way. Um, there's also, like, just registering for mailing lists. Uh, Cult Cymru is good. I just did a CPR course last week. That was amazing because I felt like I needed that skill. Um, Women in Film and TV, they have, you don't have to be a member, you can just join up and subscribe to their newsletter and they have opportunities on there. Um, I'm trying to think of, oh, Directors UK. Again, you can, you don't have to be a member, but you can subscribe to their mailing list. So just subscribe to all these things. And, and I think also, you know, joining Facebook groups, um, being aware of, you know, following people on Twitter that you want to connect with. I'm seeing lots of job postings or opportunities, you know, um, that you can kind of connect you on their training, things like that. Great, thank you. Uh, and do keep your questions coming in via the Q&A box. Um, and just remind people this session is being recorded and will be available later on SoundCloud and YouTube as well. So I know we're sort of sharing quite a lot of information as we go. So please know that you will get a chance to listen back to that as well and take some sort of further notes if you want to. Um, We've talked a lot about sort of short films and kind of those those first steps. And we sort of talked very much about the power of having a short film, whether that's something that could be funded or Karis, as you said as well, you've sort of got a group of people together to kind of make some content. Um, another word that we've heard quite a lot about during uh, the sort of first part of this conversation is the word development. So when we sort of start to think about feature films, is it right just to get a bit of a picture about what, what does development really look like for feature films? So perhaps you've done shorts or you, you, you're sort of thinking about moving into that next step of features. Perhaps the first step is development. Could we find out a little bit from you about your experience of working development, what that really means and what might be involved in that part of the sort of feature film production? Uh, Quenver, can I come to you first? If, is that okay? Yeah, sorry, my internet was a little bit patchy there, but I gathered, talk about development, right? Development, yeah, just, just <laughs> okay, what great. it means and, and kind of what that what that step might look like for somebody that perhaps going into the first feature, so development's that first phase. What does that look like and what might it involve? Yeah, so before... Um, before I got this job, I didn't really know a huge amount about what... The world of development looked like in film um, and so essentially what it is <laughs> I'm gonna break it down you've got a great script that you want to make but it could be that there are certain things in it that are going to be too expensive or um, controversial basically anything that might put a financier or future partners off so what we do is work through the practicals and get it to a place when you know it can be a shooting script it can be ready to go to be sent out to financiers and then also just sort of um fault proofing for any cracks in the structure and the characters because if you've sat with something for years you might you might think it's totally logical that um know the characters that intricately it can be a bit confusing so it's just 
you know, as audience members, when you've watched films or TVs and be like, oh, come on, that wouldn't happen. That's sort of what, that's our job to do it before you get to shooting, so to speak. Um, and it's really great. Basically, you get money to just work on things, which coming from theatre was really enough. It's like, I can have money just to, um, but it is quite a crucial part of um, film financing in the current climate. Um, and, you know, producers and production companies means it's so much more likely to look at your script again it's got that kind of rubber seal of approving it great thanks Grenvo just lost you a little bit there but I think we can we can pick up on that so um in terms of development experience Claire and Karis for yourself uh, Claire, if I come to you first and over to you Karis after what, what's that been like for you what did that involve and and sort of what might it have led on to yeah, so um, with The Colour Room, it's been six years since I started writing it. So that gives you an idea of sort of the timeline. And I think that's actually really good, apparently, you know, in terms of the industry development. When, you know, I've come from just a general industry background. So I'm always used to things being really fast and, you know, get your charts, move, move, move. But film works very differently. You know, things take time. It's, it's so six years is good. So um, I had a finished script, uh, so a full written script beginning to end. It wasn't brilliant, but it was done. And I had a treatment as well. And the producers had bought that. They'd optioned that when once it had won Rockcliffe. And we took that treatment and full script to Film Cymru, who gave us a good sum of money to develop it. So what that meant was that it, we could polish it and get it in the best position for it to go out to market. Because if it's not as good as it could be at that stage, it's not gonna go anywhere. So you've only really got one go at this. So the producers had lots of relationships out there. So it was all ready to go. I just needed to get it in a better position. So Film Cymru were awesome. So big up to Kelly Fowler. She was like helping me develop it and give me lots of feedback um, and Kimberly as well. And um, that that was great. And then it also paid for my time. So I got I got paid to write it, which was, which was brilliant. Um, and it also paid for a script editor. So we had Kate Lees, who's amazing. So he went down to London and sat with Kate, who, you know, pulled apart the script and she's worked on everything. You know, she's she's a really famous um, script editor. So she she was really, really helpful. In fact, she, she turned around to me and she said, well, you've nailed the title, right, let's go. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, like six hours later making me... <laughs> feeling a bit crummy afterwards but yeah it's really really helpful so after that when the film Cymru money had run out we had a script that was good to go we thought you know and then it went out um into the market and you know it was really really hard um because it is a biopic and it is um period you know and and my my lecturers at the University of South Wales were dead right you know they were protecting me saying you, you make things commercial so as as Rebecca was saying, look what's out there, you know, look what's selling and, and write that way. But for me, this was a, a thing that I had to get out and I had to write. So it was a real passion project and I knew it was a good story. So I stuck with it, you know, even though I knew it wasn't necessarily the most commercial choice. Um, and, you know, it got passed, it got just, you know, some people were interested if this, if that, and, you know, it, it was very tricky to find a way before Sky eventually came in with Creative England and and paid for the lot, you know, really, really lucky. Um, we've got a director on board and it's a female led film. So female director, female producers, female writer about a woman. Um, so yeah, I think it ticked a lot of boxes. And, and I think also COVID really helped for, for me. This is a really, a real success story because projects were canceled or postponed. And I think a pot of money, you know, a small, really small pot of money in the big scheme of things became available and we were able to use that so you know it, it does work in your favour too sometimes. Fantastic thank you Claire. Uh, Karis your sort of relationship with development uh, how have you found it and the sort of how has it helped you sort of lead on or, or potentially to lead on because I know that you mentioned you're in development at the moment for a few things. Mm -hmm. I would say that development is never this the same for any like two projects right um so it's, it can be really different for film, very different for TV. Things in TV tend to happen a little bit faster, but um, like a lot of writers talk about development hell, which means like you're just in development forever. <laughs> it feels like forever, like Claire mentioned, six years. You know, it's a, I think people starting out don't realize it, it takes, 
like, yeah, five years is pretty good for um, getting a, a feature film made. Um, but for me, so I, um, the first feature I worked on was an adaptation of a play. So um, we, because the play was really successful, um, that uh, the story was um, optioned. And then I was brought on to co-write the script with the playwright, um, who's my writing partner and kind of my creative partner. Um, and that was funded through Telefilm Canada and Film Cymru have been really supportive. So that's an example of, you know, two different uh, development and funding bodies kind of putting money um, into one, one project. Um, and so, I mean, I, I, I personally really love development. I love writing, I like getting notes back. Um, and I find it really rewarding when you take sort of a really rough first draft and you, you, you know, maybe a few years later, you have something really solid and that you've really nurtured. Um, and so we wrote that um, kind of quite traditionally. So first draft, you know, notes, 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 second draft, third draft, polish. Um, and then the feature I'm working on at the moment has actually been quite different. So um, again, supported by Film Cymru, but we're spending a lot more time on the outline. So um, we've probably spent like, I guess like a year and a half on just the outline. Um, but once we start writing, like it's gonna be a really quick writing process. So I think like it's it's different for each project, right? So we're working right now with um, a story editor who's amazing on the outline. So the, the structure, the kinks, the, the emotional arcs, um, everything is like really being dissected at this point before we even start writing. So that's, that's the first time for me to write that way. Um, and then with film and uh, with TV, um, it's a little bit different because, you know, you have more of a structure. So um, the way a script is structured for a one hour is different from an, a half hour. Um, you'll work with uh, your development execs at the broadcaster um, that's that's funding, or maybe it's a production company that's that's funding your work. Um, but yeah, I think the one thing I didn't realize was how long development can take. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, it's one of those things and it does take quite a while. And I, I will come in a slightly flip side of what you've all said. And I haven't actually had any development money and I've had to put a lot of time into developing projects and yeah. developing lookbooks and things. But I do think it's a, particularly for directors or people on board to really an opportunity to really develop your vision and to kind of really think about what it is that you want to put out there. What is, what is it that you want to say? What is, what is the look, yeah. the feel, the story that, that it is that you want to tell? And um, I think that's, as film, yeah. isn't it? something that's very personal to, to us. And I, I will say like, these are all things that have been funded, right? Like I've written lots of stuff that I haven't been paid to write. And I think, I think we have to be, I think we have to have more of a honest conversation about like <laughs> how much money we're making, um, what we're making money for. I still, you know, I still do work for free because I have to, like I make, you know, I wrote a pilot during COVID um, because I, I needed to. Um, I've written and created tons of pitch decks for different TV shows. Um, because, you know, like you need to, you need a really, really solid pitch deck that outlines, you know, what happens in the pilot and really outlines what happens in the season um, for a producer or a production company to get interested. And that takes a lot of work, right? Um, it can be like months and months and months. So um, I think just to be clear, I 
like I don't get paid like all the writing I do <laughs> I'm not getting paid to, to do it all I mean I, th- I think very much you know, isn't it that creativity drives us filmmakers first because the reality is is that the paycheck can come sometimes down the road so as Gwen said right at the beginning juggling lots of different things to help pay the bills and keep the yeah. gravity flowing is really key I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the questions very soon in the, in the Q&A box I will come to your questions I've got some very quick fire questions I'd like to chuck out to uh to the three of you um what piece of advice no, do you know what? I'm going to save that to the end. Actually, I'm going to save that to the end. I'm going to ask you just as we're talking about visions as filmmakers, but who is it? Who inspires you in film? So just before we hand to the Q&A box, who is who is the person that inspires you in film? OK, well, I'll go first. Um, Emma Thompson. So I think she's amazing. She's written the um, Sense and Sensibility Diaries that I read, and that really helped me realize what normal is when when someone's shooting a film it's fantastic she she works across genre she's she's she can do anything she's an actor and producer and director and um writer amazing writer oscar winning writer um i i just think she's she's wonderful and she took time out for her family as well so she's got a real attitude towards balance which is really mm-hmm. strong you know fantastic thank you claire uh, gwen Ver, who's your who inspires you in film i think it's going to be um, um Bong Joon-ho, I just think the fact that he can do stuff that is so out there and unique, but then he can also do a kind of blockbuster like Snowpiercer, but infuse it with these kind of elements that are really philosophical, or really, really beautiful. I just think he manages to elevate every single film that he makes. And um, mm. I'm a bit obsessed, basically. <laughs> Brilliant. Snowpiercer is a great film as well. It's a really good shout. Uh, fantastic. Thank you. And Karis, just quickly to you before we go to our Q&A box, who inspires you in film? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I've always had like a major uh, film crush on uh, Sarah Sugarman. Um, she's a Welsh filmmaker. She um, did Very Annie Mary and then Confessions of the Teenage Drama Queen. Um, I think she's like doing more stuff um, now. And people like Lynn Ramsey, I think, is amazing. Um, just a, like a a fan, and a just amazing filmmaker who's also working in film and TV, Andrea Arnold. Um, it's also a fave of mine. Right, and Sarah Sugarman's actually directing the Save the Cinema film, which is around uh, the story of the night in the night set in the nineties for the campaign to keep a small cinema open in Carmarthen mm-hmm. and to show the premiere premiere of Jurassic Park there. So one to watch there, Karis, if you're a Sarah Sugarman fan. And um, I'm going to go to our Q and A box and I'm going to get some questions in from uh, all our audience out there. I hope that you found it useful so far. And um, the first question that's actually in the box comes from. Emily, uh, Claire, I think you might have already answered this as we've been going. So uh, specifically, I'm currently complete, um, completing an MA in creative writing and my dissertation is also a screenplay. I was wondering how you went about getting the script out there and eventually developed into a film. I think we've sort of covered that, but is there anything else you just want to add to that uh, in terms of that sort of question, Claire? Yeah, yeah. Good luck, Emily. Um... I, I would say, you know, obviously one of the things we've not really touched on now, I don't know whether we will do it in a bit, but it's agents, you know, getting an agent. And, and um, I'd heard this thing that was like getting the right agent is really important. And I didn't care about that. I just wanted an agent. You know, do you know how hard it is to get an agent? You know, and part of our MA was, you know, about trying to get an agent. And they, they were just saying it's, it's impossible. No one's reading. It's just really difficult. Um, but I actually, I've had two agents now. So my first agent was a really big agency. Um, and I was just completely starstruck. I was so overwhelmed and, um, they were dealing with the top talent internationally. And I was, I was there with them and I was just tiny. I was nothing, you know, and, and they had much bigger things to be doing than, than to be helping me. And it just was not a good fit at all. And, um, I'm now with a very small agency, but it's amazing. So he's like, he's all over it. He knows where to go, what to do. He has time for me. And, you know, since going with my second agent, my career has has just shot off. And I I never would have thought that would be the case. And when they say get the right agent, really do look out for the right agent. And the biggest ones aren't always the best ones when you're starting out. 
Absolutely. Thank you, Claire, for that. And thanks for adding that. Emily, I hope that's helped with your question today. I'm going to go to Jenny's question next, actually. Um, Jenny's sort of asking, have you found that development slates are on hold at the moment because of the change in uh, budgets and uncertain circumstances with the pandemic? Or are we finding that people are actually open to taking on new projects? I know that we've covered a little bit of that at the moment, but Gwenver, am I right in saying that the development slate is open for Film Cymru Wales at the moment? Um, so we've moved back into thrice yearly deadlines. So I think the next one is, oh God, I should know this. I think it's July. Um, we won't hold yeah, it we're still... on the website. <laughs> <laughs> Go to the website because that will be more correct than me. Um, but yeah, we're open and we're looking for more projects. You know, it, as I said before, it's kind of the one part of Film Cymru, I think, that we've had to kind of change some of our approaches through COVID, you know, none of our meetings are in person, that kind of thing. But it has been an area of the industry that I think. Thank you. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think one of the pieces of advice that I would also just throw out very quickly is please don't send your scripts or stories just to random production companies to ask if they would consider it. Um, often production companies will just simply delete these those emails because they can't take what's sort of called unsolicited emails because obviously they could be by chance working on a very similar idea. Uh, to you and obviously you know it does get very complicated sometimes if you just send work over to companies they often won't read it so I would say if you wanted to talk to production companies just get to know them first get to know their work and approach them have a chat with them maybe at a networking event when we hopefully get back out in person um, rather than sort of sending stuff off hoping that they might take it into development but please do keep an eye on Film Cymru Wales website for the for the next slate for that uh, Jenny I hope that helps with your question I'm going to go to Rowan next so Rowan's a bilingual Wales based actor um, and also an IMS winner. Congratulations, Rowan. Uh, I'm in between agents and debating between a local agency or looking more at the main London agents uh, and bearing in uh, uh, bearing in minimum equity cast it here campaign. I can understand the names. Uh, da -da -da -da, so just quickly. OK, I can understand the need for names and star power in box office draw, but where do you think, where do you prefer as filmmakers to source your talent? OK, so good question there. Obviously, Rowan, uh, actor, sort of bilingual as well, which is fantastic, particularly obviously here in Wales, fun, you know, really good. But where do you where do you kind of go to source your talents? Um, you know, particularly emerging talents uh, such as Rowan herself. Where do you go when you're sort of casting? I think for you know for smaller, like when we did um, the fact that first the fact that you're bilingual, awesome. It will you know it it will really help your career. Um, I think when I was casting Welsh language stuff, definitely, you know, um, Wales-based uh, talent agencies. I think the, oh, the, the, the acting agent question is so tricky. I used to be an actor, um, you know, I've had acting agents. It is, it is tricky. I would say, you know, send yourself stuff off to, to everyone. And I think what Claire said about finding the right agent for you and that personality fit, it goes the same for acting agent as well. Um, I think it's the person who's gonna work for you the hardest and like really believes in, in what you have, um, have to offer. But I think, you know, and then when we're talking, you know, big a budget TV and film, then I would say, you know, it, it, it's, you usually work with a casting director and that process is a little bit different. You go, um, you go to different agencies, and you know, like for my short film, at least, like I, I wasn't really able to audition um, my two lead roles because they were more established names, and so you just kind of send them an offer um, instead of asking them to read. Right. I Thank think you. as well. Think about your career as a series of tiny, tiny steps. So whenever my successes have been successes and not failures of which I've had billions. Um, it's been the small steps that have done it. So maybe think about getting an agent for now that will get you a lot of work, but at a smaller level, build up and, and go from there. So for me, I had one massive London agent, didn't work out, I have a smaller London based agent, but now getting an American agent. So I would never have gone and got an American agent first of all, that just wouldn't happen. So I've only been able to do that get to that level because I have a good London agent so maybe you know maybe you do a smaller step first 
and build up from that. And, and the smaller the step, like, like just picking away with your axe at, at, mm. at the rock face, you know, you stand much more of a chance than just, just trying to go for gold. If that mm. makes sense. Yeah, thank you, Claire. And Rowan also commented late, did later on in the box, just saying that she was li love listening to your experiences, Claire, as a writer. I feel like I'm where I'm starting out in a writing point of view. So she just said she really enjoyed listening to your experience as a writer. Thanks for those questions so far from everybody. We're going to get to Chris's question next. And he's uh, asking about, is there specific avenues into directing uh, for people who want to work in TV or film production? So thinking about the directing route, are there specific routes in at all? Any thoughts? On um, I think it it kind of depends on if you want to um, work in in film or TV. But I think getting experience on set, whether that says you know a PA, um, a runner, like those are kind of the usual ways in. So um, those roles where you can get time on set and watch what is happening without needing a ton of experience. Um, and then you just want to shoot stuff like you just want to you just got to like even if it's with your phone or um you know i like i shot at the very first thing i shot was an interview series um and i just rented a camera for a couple of days and it was super simple um but i think you just need to to learn on the job right like you're not going to learn how to direct by reading a book so i would say get get experience, network with people, offer to help out for free if you can, you know, um, and uh, work on these like beacons, shots, um, and, and things like that, I think is always, always helpful. Watch films, read scripts, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I'm looking at all these wonderful questions coming in. I'm not sure if we're going to have time for all of them. So I'm just going to apologise now as your host. If I don't get around to your question, I will whiz through them as quickly as we can. Uh, Karis, I'm just going to use the next qu question. If you can give us a quick snappy answer. Uh, we've got a question around Simone and she would like to know a bit more about what a pitch deck is. Could you just share a little bit more about what that is for us? OK, so a pitch deck is a document that summarises uh, your idea uh, for your film or TV series. So before or maybe while you're writing and you want to send out kind of as like a taster of what your project is about. Uh, if you go online, Netflix has um, actually a quite good example of what they're looking for in a pitch deck. So you can find examples online. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, Amir's just asking now around, uh, he's actually a cinema programme, thanks for joining us Amir, um, and he's just wondering if we know what films people might be wanting to see when they go back to the cinemas, um, and obviously not pandemic stories, I think I'm probably inclined to... I was going to say, I did not want to watch anything <laughs> no. about a pandemic. I mean, that's what I've been hearing from, like, from broadcasters when I'm pitching is like nothing to do with the pandemic. And I mean, this is what I've been hearing. I don't know, it's, it's everyone's taste, but like more comedy and more escape escapism. Um, I think that's what I've been hearing anyway. Yeah, no, me too. Me too, more comedy and escapism, lighter things, hope, hopeful stories, you know, big things as well, cinematic things, because we've done yeah. we've done home cinema now. So the biggest mm -hmm. stuff like Light Bond, you know, which is, is it coming early next year? Um, I think that's going to do really well because it's going to deliver the, the um, cinema experience. So we're looking for things that really look good on screen, on a big screen. Yeah, um, absolutely. Gwenver, is there anything that you think are you in agreement? Everyone's, we're all nodding, aren't we? We're all, I think, in agreement <laughs> on that. I <laughs> no, completely agree. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> Nothing got, to add there. <laughs> I've got another question um, from somebody who's a content producer, and they're just wondering if there's a bit of a snobbery or perhaps a difference between then the work that they've done as a content producer for PR and whether they might have to take a step back if they're going into the film or tv industry so just whether or not people have to take step backs or sideways steps depending if they're quite far ahead as perhaps a content producer for something else is that people's experience at all i, th I think the people i've met have been um elastic you know i think it depends from my point of view had to do different things um so yeah some, sometimes it, it's not necessarily a step back it's a step sideways but the people I've met have been unbelievably lovely, you know, just just 
professional, kind, courteous, you know, not not up themselves, not I'm working in film, you know, none of that, you know, and these are these are big people in the film industry, you know, and, and, and they've been just so welcoming, no matter what level you are. Um, so there's there's no feeling of, of working down, you know, we're all in it together, which is lovely. Great, thank you, Claire. I'm very conscious on time. I'm just going to ask you a quick question, which I was going to ask earlier, and I stopped myself. So this is to each of you on the panel is what piece or what one piece of advice do you wish that you'd received when you started out in your career in film? So what was that one piece of advice, you know, in hindsight now, I think, God, I really wish somebody had told me that way back. Is there one piece of advice that you can think of? I've got one that was actually given to me by an ex-manager when I worked for a theatre. Um, and I think this is this is particularly true for producers, but also for writer directors, is run at the problem. If there's a, if there's an issue in your budget or in your script, it's not going to go away. And don't let don't build up a kind of brick wall and get afraid of it. Just run at the problem because that's the only way you're going to smash through it. And whenever I'm kind of paralysed with self doubt or whatever, I just hear my old boss's voice being like, "Just run at the problem, whatever. Just run at it." I love um, that. Yeah. Thank you. I love that. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Karis, have you got a sort of nugget that you wish that you'd heard when you were starting out? Um, gosh, I would say mine's like a general one. So I think. A lot of advice you have to experience before you can really take it. You're like, oh, right. You know, that thing that that person said to me when I was 20, I should have listened to. But I think, you know, you can have lots of ups and downs in this industry. It's really tough. You get, you deal with a lot of rejection. But I think as much as you can, don't define your worth as a human being um, on how successful, right, you are um, in this industry. So nurture your relationships, take breaks, go on vacation. Um, you know, you, you need to nurture your personal life um, because I think that, you know, this industry can also be really unhealthy. So I think that's really, really important um, to remember you're a human and you're not defined by your work. Great answer, Karis. And also I wanted to sort of check in on how people do manage their work-life balance, but I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to get time for that. But um, Claire, what's the piece of advice that you wish that you would, you'd kind of received? Um, take baby steps. Just, just um, you know, go, go really, really small and, and you'll eventually get there. And just don't be, don't be cowed by it. It's, it's a really good industry and really friendly, full of good people. You know, it, it's nothing to be scared of. It's nothing to be intimidated by or overawed by. It's just people doing a job. And, and if you wanted to be a plumber, you wouldn't decide, it. oh, I feel like I'm going to be a plumber and I'll plumber an entire house. You wouldn't do that. You'd, you'd mm. sit in an apprenticeship, you'd learn, you'd do little bit by bit. Just imagine it's being like a plumber, just do bit by bit, learn everything, learn the trade. That's what it is, it's a job and learn the trade. Don't be overawed by the starlight and stuff. And it's, you know, be realistic. Mm. Great advice, Claire. And how do you manage your work-life balance? Is there sort of particular things that you do to try and, you know, sort of not get sort of over, over sort of um, thrown by it all? Because it can be quite intense. But like you say, it's, it's also very, very incredibly rewarding. So do you, Gwen Vera and Claire, I know Claire, you've already touched on this, but do you have any top tips in terms of balancing your, your work life? And uh, Yeah, well, and now I'm living the dream. I'm, I'm a paid writer and I don't have any other job, which is awesome. So that's that's... I'm done. But before that, I had a full time job and kids, um, two teenagers, and um, it was really tough. And what I did was I worked at 5 a.m. till half past seven in the morning. So they got the best out of me, you know, in terms of writing. I didn't do it at the end of the day when I'd taken my kids to clubs and I'd had a day at the office. You know, I had nothing to give. I was exhausted. Um, so I had yeah, five till seven thirty. And it's surprising after a couple of months how you just get up and do it and and. Uh, yeah, Arnold Bennett wrote a little book about getting up at five in the morning and it's it's worth a read. It'll take you two hours to read and it's just, it's really good. But just give read it- Read it between five and seven. <laughs> Great <laughs> advice. Uh, that's brilliant, Claire. Thank you. Gwenver, do you have any sort of, how do you balance your work life? I'm really bad. <laughs> Probably not the best one to answer this, but I think it's because um, before I worked in film, the thing that I would do to sort of relax was to watch a film. <laughs> But that can feel like a bit of a busman's holiday. So this is like, I'm no athlete, but one thing that I really, really swear by is like at the end of the day now, just going to the gym. <laughs> I'm putting some music on and just kind of being physical as opposed to just receiving things mm -hmm. from a screen. Um, 
yeah get in touch with my inner hippie excellent mm. i think we should all get in touch with our inner hippies more often i'm going to do one very last question if that's okay everybody i know we'll go a little minute over but i've uh, just got one last person who's just asked a question in the q a and i just want to make sure that we get to them um so i'm looking for first hands on experience in film production and runner looks like the only sort of option to start as an unexperienced individual are there other paths to follow uh, i would definitely say get out there and make some short films yourself as well just to put yourself out there in a different way any other sort of advice in terms of that first run of the ladder and um, that may not be a sort of a runner experience any other paths to follow um assisting producers um you know uh working maybe in the production office uh even if it's like a production office of a of, of an agency you know as a receptionist um i think it, just being in the industry seeing how things work i think always always helps yeah absolutely i've met a few people that have started out being receptionists or being a runner or, or doing that and, and working their way up that way so absolutely brilliant Thank you. Great. Um, I think we have run out of time today. Uh, I just want to say a huge thank you to all the attendees of this session and for your questions. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed it and thoroughly enjoyed being a part of it. Uh, Karis, I want to give you a big nod for dressing up as Princess Leia today on uh, the Star Wars Day. Uh, added some <laughs> tributes behind as well. So I just wanted to give a little shout out there. Thank you very much to all of my speakers today. I've really enjoyed being in this space with you and finding out a bit more about your careers. Thank you. A uh, huge thank you to our supporting partners for this session, Screen Alliance Wales, Off Your Grid, um, off a grid and Pontier and Diocumval, thank you very much indeed. And um, we hope that you've enjoyed the discussion. And please, please do continue the conversation over on socials, which is the has hashtag GuruLive. Thank you once again. All the best. Stay safe and goodbye.